Chapter Six of the Story of the Atlantic Cable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Chapter Six The Storm. The wire ships, thus additionally experienced, arrived at Plymouth on June third, and some further arrangements were made principally connected with the electrical department a week later that is on thursday june tenth having taken in a fresh supply of coal the expedition again left england with fair skies and bright prospects the barometer standing at thirty point sixty four it was an auspicious start in what was declared by a consensus of nautical authorities to be the best time of the year for the atlantic this prognostication was doomed to a terrible disappointment for the voyage nearly ended in the agamemnon turning turtle she was repeatedly almost on her beam ends the cable was partly shifted and a large number of those on board were more or less seriously injured the load of cables made all the difference when brought into comparison with an ordinary ship under stress of weather it was bad enough to cruise with a dead weight forward of some two hundred and fifty tons a weight under which her planks gaped an inch apart and her beams threatened daily to give way but when to these evils were added the fear that in some of her heavy rolls the whole mass would slip and take the vessel's side out it will be seen that this precious coil was justly regarded as a standing danger, the millstone about the necks of all on board. Oddly enough, owing to the fact that the Agamemnon had scant accommodation left for fuel, everyone at the start was bemoaning the entire absence of breeze. There were some even, who never having been at sea before, muttered rash hopes about meeting an Atlantic gale their wishes were soon to be completely realized in order that laying operations should be started by the two ships in mid-ocean it was arranged that the entire fleet should meet in latitude fifty three degrees two minutes and longitude thirty three degrees eighteen minutes as a rendezvous as it is impossible to follow the movements of more than one ship at a time and as the agamemnon had the more exciting experience we will confine our attention to her up to the date of the rendezvous the day after starting there was no wind but on saturday june twelfth a breeze sprung up and with screw hoisted and fires raked out the agamemnon bowled along at a rare pace under royals and studding sails the barometer fell fast and squally weather coming on with the boisterous premonitory symptoms of an atlantic gale even those least versed in such matters could see at a glance that they were in for it the following day the sky wore a wretched mist half rain half vapour through which the attendant vessels loomed faintly like shadows the gale increased till at four in the afternoon the good ship was rushed through the foam under close-reefed topsails and foresail that night the storm got worse and most of the squadron gradually parted company the ocean resembled one vast snowdrift the whitish glare from which reflected from the dark clouds that almost rested on the sea had a tremendous and unnatural effect as if the ordinary laws of nature had been reversed very heavy weather continued till the following sunday june twentieth which ushered in as fierce a storm as ever swept over the atlantic the narrative of this fight of nautical science with the elements may best be continued in the words of the representative of the times especially as it is probably the most intensely realistic description of a storm that has ever been written by an eye-witness the niagara which had hitherto kept close 
while the other small vessels had dropped out of sight, began to give us a very wide berth, and as darkness increased it was a case of every one for himself. Our ship, the Agamemnon, rolling many degrees, not every one can imagine how she went at it that night, was laboring so heavily that she looked like breaking up. The massive beams under her upper deck coil cracked and snapped with a noise resembling that of small artillery, almost drowning the hideous roar of the wind as it moaned and howled through the rigging, jerking and straining the little storm sails as though it meant to tear them from the yards. Those in the impoverished cabins on the main deck had little sleep that night, for the upper deck planks above them were working themselves free, as sailors say, and beyond a doubt they were infinitely more free than easy, for they groaned under the pressure of the coil with a dreadful uproar, and availed themselves of the opportunity to let in a little light, with a good deal of water, at every roll. The sea, too, kept striking with dull, heavy violence against the vessel's bows, forcing its way through the hawse-holes and ill-closed ports with a heavy slush, and thence, hissing and winding aft, it roused the occupants of the cabins aforesaid to a knowledge that their floors were under water, and that the flotsam and jetsam noises they heard beneath were only caused by their outfit for the voyage, taking a cruise of its own in some five or six inches of dirty bilge. Such was Sunday night, and such was a fair average of all the nights throughout the week, varying only from bad to worse. On Monday things became desperate. The barometer was lower, and, as a matter of course, the wind and sea were infinitely higher than the day before. It was singular, but at twelve o'clock the sun pierced through the pall of clouds and shone brilliantly for half an hour, and during that brief time it blew as it had not often blown before. So fierce was this gust that its roar drowned every other sound and it was almost impossible to give the watch the necessary orders for taking in the close reefer foresail, which, when furled, almost left the Agamemnon under bare poles, though still surging through the water at speed. This gust passed. The usual gale set in, now blowing steadily from the southwest and taking us more and more out of our course each minute. Every hour the storm got worse, till toward five in the afternoon, when it seemed at its height, and raged with such a violence of wind and sea that matters really looked desperate, even for such a strong and large ship as the Agamemnon. The upper deck coil had strained her decks throughout excessively, and though this mass, in theory, was supposed to prevent her rolling so quickly and heavily as she would have done without it, yet still she heeled over to such an alarming extent that fears of the coil itself shifting again occupied every mind, and it was accordingly strengthened with additional shores bolted down to the deck. The space occupied by the main coil below had deprived the Agamemnon of several of her coal bunkers, and in order to make up for this deficiency, as well as to endeavor to counterbalance the immense mass which weighed her down by the head, a large quantity of coals had been stowed on the deck aft. On each side of her main deck were thirty-five tons secured in a mass, while on the lower deck ninety tons were stowed away in the same manner. The precautions taken to secure these huge masses also required attention as the great ship surged from side to side. But these coals seemed secure, and were so, in fact, unless the vessel should almost capsize, an unpleasant alternative which no one certainly anticipated then. Everything, therefore, was made snug, as sailors call it, though their efforts by no means resulted in the comfort which might have been expected from the term. The night, however, passed over without any mischance beyond the smashing of all things incautiously left loose and capable of rolling, and one or two attempts which the Agamemnon made in the middle watch to turn bottom upward. In all other matters it was the mere ditto of Sunday night. 
except perhaps a little worse, and certainly much more wet below. Tuesday, the gale continued with almost unabated force, though the barometer had risen to 29.30, and there was sufficient sun to take a clear observation, which showed our distance from the rendezvous to be 563 miles. During this afternoon, the Niagara joined company, and the wind going more ahead, the Agamemnon took to violent pitching, plunging steadily into the trough of the sea as if she meant to break her back and lay the Atlantic cable in a heap. This change in her motion strained and taxed every inch of timber near the coils to the very utmost. It was curious to see how they worked and bent, as the Agamemnon went at everything she met head first. One time she pitched so heavily as to break one of the main beams of the lower deck, which had to be shored with screwjacks forthwith. Saturday, the 19th of June, things looked a little better. The barometer seemed inclined to go up, and the sea to go down and for the first time that morning since the gale began, some six days previous, the decks could be walked with tolerable comfort and security. But, alas, appearances are as deceitful in the Atlantic as elsewhere, and during a comparative calm that afternoon, the glass fell lower, while a thin line of black haze to windward seemed to grow up into the sky until it covered the heavens with a sombre darkness and warned us that after all the worst was yet to come there was much heavy rain that evening and then the wind began not violently nor in gusts but with a steadily increasing force as if the gale was determined to do its work slowly but do it well the sea was ready built to hand as sailors say so at first the storm did little more than urge on the ponderous masses of water with redoubled force and fill the air with the foam and spray it tore from their rugged crests by and by however it grew more dangerous and captain preedy himself remained on deck throughout the middle watch for the wind was hourly getting worse and worse and the agamemnon rolling thirty degrees each way, was straining to a dangerous extent. At four a.m., sail was shortened to close reefer, fore and main topsails and reefed foresail, a long and tedious job, for the wind so roared and howled, and the hiss of the boiling sea was so deafening that words of command were useless, and the men, aloft, holding on with all their might to the yards as the ship rolled over and over almost to the water, were quite incapable of struggling with the masses of wet canvas that flapped and plunged, as if men and yards and everything were going away together. The ship was almost as wet inside as out, and so things wore on till eight or nine o'clock, everything getting adrift and being smashed and every one on board jamming themselves up in corners or holding on to beams to prevent their going adrift likewise at ten o'clock the agamemnon was rolling and laboring fearfully with the sky getting darker and both wind and sea increasing every minute at about half past ten o'clock three or four gigantic waves were seen approaching the ship coming slowly on through the mist nearer and nearer, rolling on like hills of green water and a crown of foam that seemed to double their height. The Agamemnon rose heavily to the first, and then went down quickly into the deep trough of the sea, falling over as she did so, so as almost to capsize completely on the port side. There was a fearful crashing as she lay over this way, for everything broke adrift, whether secured or not, and the uproar and confusion were terrific for a minute. Then back she came again on the starboard beam in the same manner, only quicker and still deeper than before. Again there was the same noise and crashing, and the officers in the wardroom, who knew the danger of the ship, struggled to their feet and opened the door leading to the main deck. Here, for an instant, the scene almost defies description. 
amid loud shouts and efforts to save themselves a confused mass of sailors boys and marines with deck buckets ropes ladders and everything that could get loose and which had fallen back again to the port side were being hurled again in a mass across the ship to starboard dimly and only for an instant could this be seen with groups of men clinging to the beams with all their might with a mass of water which had forced its way through ports and decks surging about and then with a tremendous crash as the ship fell still deeper over the coals stowed on the main deck broke loose and smashing everything before them went over among the rest to leeward the coal dust hid everything on the main deck in an instant but the crashing could still be heard going on in all directions as the lumps and sacks of coal with stanchions ladders and mess tins went leaping about the decks pouring down the hatchways and crashing through the glass skylights into the engine room below still it was not done and surging again over another tremendous wave the agamemnon dropped down still more to port and the coals on the starboard side of the lower deck gave way also and carried everything before them matters now became serious for it was evident that two or three more lurches and the mast would go like reeds while half the crew might be maimed or killed below Captain Preedy was already on the poop with Lieutenant Gibson, and it was hands wear ship at once, while Mr. Brown, the indefatigable chief engineer, was ordered to get up steam immediately. The crew gained the deck with difficulty, and not till after a lapse of some minutes, for all the ladders had been broken away, the men were grimed with coal dust, and many bore still more serious marks upon their faces of how they had been knocked about below there was some confusion at first for the storm was fearful the officers were quite inaudible and a wild dangerous sea running mountains high heeled the great ship backward and forward so that the crew were unable to keep their feet for an instant and in some cases were thrown across the decks in a fearful manner two marines went with a rush head foremost into the paying-out machine, as if they had meant to butt it over the side. Yet, strange to say, neither the men nor the machine suffered. What made matters worse, the ship's barge, though lashed down to the deck, had partly broken loose, and dropping from side to side as the vessel lurched, it threatened to crush any who ventured to pass it. The regular discipline of the ship, however, soon prevailed, and the crew set to work to wear round the ship on the starboard tack while lieutenants robinson and murray went below to see after those who had been hurt and about the number of whom extravagant rumours prevailed among the men there were however unfortunately but too many the marine sentry outside the wardroom door on the main deck had not had time to escape and was completely buried under the coals some time elapsed before he could be got out for one of the beams used to shore up the sacks which had crushed his arm very badly still lay across the mangled limb jamming it in such a manner that it was found impossible to remove it without risking the man's life saws therefore had to be sent for and the timber sawn away before the poor fellow could be extricated another marine on the lower deck endeavoured to save himself by catching hold of what seemed a ledge in the planks but unfortunately it was only caused by the beams straining apart and of course as the agamemnon righted they closed again and crushed his fingers flat one of the assistant engineers was also buried among the coals on the lower deck and sustained some severe internal injuries the lurch of the ship was calculated at forty-five degrees each way for five times in rapid succession the galley coppers were only half filled with soup nevertheless it nearly all poured out and scalded some of the poor fellows who were extended on the decks holding on to anything in reach these with a dislocation were the chief casualties 
but there were others of bruises and contusions more or less severe and of course a long list of escapes more marvellous than any injury one poor fellow went head first from the main deck into the hold without being hurt and one of the orlop deck was chevied about for some ten minutes by three large casks of oil which had got adrift and any one of which would have flattened him like a pancake had it overtaken him as soon as the agamemnon had gone round on the other tack the niagara wore also and bore down as if to render assistance she had witnessed our danger and as we afterward learned imagined that the upper deck coil had broken loose and that we were sinking things however were not so bad as that though they were bad enough heaven knows for everything seemed to go wrong that day the upper deck coil had strained the ship to the very utmost but still held on fast but not so the coil in the main hold which had begun to get adrift and the top kept working and shifting over from side to side as the ship lurched until some forty or fifty miles were in a hopeless state of tangle resembling nothing so much as a cargo of live eels and there was every prospect of the tangle spreading deeper and deeper as the bad weather continued going round upon the starboard tack had eased the ship to a certain extent but with such a wind and such a sea both of which were getting worse than better it was impossible to effect much for the agamemnon's relief and so by twelve o'clock she was rolling almost as badly as ever the crew who had been at work since nearly four in the morning were set to clear up the decks from the masses of coal that covered them and while this was going forward a heavy sea struck the stern and smashed the large iron guard frame which had been fixed there to prevent the cable fouling the screw and paying out now that one side had broken it was expected every moment that other parts would go and the pieces hanging down either smash the screw or foul the rudder post it is not overestimating the danger to say that had the latter accident occurred in such a sea and with a vessel so overladen the chances would have been sadly against the agamemnon ever appearing at the rendezvous fortunately it was found possible to secure the broken frame temporarily with hawsers so as to prevent it dropping farther though nothing could hinder the fractured end from striking against the vessel's side with such force as to lead to serious apprehensions that it would establish a dangerous leak under water it was near three in the afternoon before this was quite secured the gale still continuing and the sea running ever worse the condition of the masts too at this time was a source of much anxiety both to captain Preedy and mr moriarty the master the heavy rolling had strained and slackened the wire shrouds to such an extent that they had become perfectly useless as supports the lower masts bent visibly at every roll and once or twice it seemed as if they must go by the board unfortunately nothing whatever could be done to relieve this strain by sending down any of the upper spars since it was only her masts which prevented the ship rolling still more and quicker and so every one knew that if once they were carried away it might soon be all over with the ship and then the deck coil could not help going after them so there was nothing for it but to watch in anxious silence the way they bent and strained and trust in providence for the result about six in the evening it was thought better to wear ship again and stand for the rendezvous under easy steam and her head accordingly was put about and once more faced the storm as she went round she of course fell into the trough of the sea again and rolled so awfully as to break her waste steam pipe filling her engine room with steam and depriving her of the services of one boiler when it was sorely needed the sun set upon as wild and wicked a night as ever taxed the courage and coolness of a sailor there were of course men on board who were familiar with gales and storms in all parts of the world and there were some who had witnessed the tremendous hurricane which swept the black sea 
on the memorable fourteenth of november when scores of vessels were lost and seamen perished by the thousands but of all on board none had ever seen a fiercer or more dangerous sea than raged throughout the night and the following morning tossing the agamemnon from side to side like a mere plaything among the waters the night was thick and very dark the low black clouds almost hemming the vessel in now and then a fiercer blast than usual drove the great masses slowly aside and showed the moon a dim greasy blotch upon the sky with the ocean white as driven snow boiling and seething like a cauldron but these were only glimpses which were soon lost and again it was all darkness through which the waves suddenly upheaving rushed upon the ship as though they must overwhelm it and dealing it one staggering blow went hissing and surging past into the darkness again the grandeur of the scene was almost lost in its dangers and terrors for all of the many forms in which death approaches man there is none so easy in fact so terrific in appearance as death by shipwreck sleeping was impossible that night on board the agamemnon even those in cots were thrown out from their striking against the vessel's side as she pitched the berths of wood-fixed arthwart chips in the cabins on the main deck had worked to pieces chairs and tables were broken chests of drawers capsized and a little surf was running over the floors of the cabins themselves pouring miniature seas into portamentos and breaking over carpet-bags of clean linen fast as it flowed off by the scuppers it came in faster by the hawse holes and ports while the beams and knees strained with a doleful noise as though it was impossible they could hold together much longer and on the whole it was as miserable and even anxious a night as ever was passed on board any line of battleship in her majesty's service captain preedy never left the poop all night though it was hard work to remain there even holding on to the poop rail with both hands morning brought no change save that the storm was as fierce as ever and though the sea could not be higher or wilder yet the additional amount of broken water made it still more dangerous to the ship very dimly and only now and then through the thick scud the niagara could be seen one moment on a monstrous hill of water and the next quite lost to view as the agamemnon went down between the waves but even these glimpses showed us that our transatlantic consort was plunging heavily shipping seas and evidently having a bad time of it though she got through it better than the agamemnon as of course she could having only the same load though two thousand tons larger suddenly it came on darker and thicker and we lost sight of her in the thick spray and had only ourselves to look after this was quite enough for every minute made matters worse and the aspect of affairs began to excite most serious misgivings in the minds of those in charge the agamemnon is one of the finest line of battle ships in the whole navy but in such a storm and so heavily overladen what could she do but make bad weather worse and strain and labor and fall into the trow of the sea as if she were going down head foremost three or four hours more and the vessel had borne all she could bear with safety the masts were rapidly getting worse the deck coil worked more and more with each tremendous plunge and even if both these held it was evident that the ship itself would soon strain to pieces if the weather continued so the sea forcing its way through ports and hawse holes had accumulated on the lower deck to such an extent that it flooded the stoke-hole so that men could scarcely remain at their posts everything went smashing and rolling about one plunge put all the electrical instruments hors de combat at a blow and staved 
some barrels of strong solution of sulphate of copper which went cruising about turning all it touched to a light pea green by and by she began to ship seas water came down the ventilators near the funnel into the engine room then a tremendous sea struck her forward drenching those on deck and leaving them up to their knees in water and the least first on board could see that things were fast going to the bad unless a change took place in the weather or the condition of the ship of the first there seemed little chance the weather certainly showed no disposition to clear on the contrary livid-looking black clouds seemed to be closing round the vessel faster and faster than ever for the relief of the ship three courses were open to captain preedy one to wear round and try her on the starboard tack as she had been compelled to do the day before another to fairly run for it before the wind and third and last to endeavor to lighten the vessel by getting some of the cable overboard of course the latter would not have been thought of till the first two had been tried and failed in fact not till it was evident that nothing else could save the ship against wearing ground there was the danger of her again falling off into the trough of the sea losing her masts shifting her upper deck coil and so finding her way to the bottom in ten minutes while to attempt running before the storm with such a sea on was to risk her stern being stove in and a hundred tons of water added to her burden with each wave that came up afterward till the poor agamemnon went under them all for ever a little after ten o'clock on monday the twenty first the aspect of affairs was so alarming that captain preedy resolved at all risks to try wearing the ship round on the other tack it was hard enough to make the words of command audible but to execute them seemed almost impossible the ship's head went round enough to leave her broadside on to the seas and then for a time it seemed as if nothing could be done all the rolls which she had ever given on the previous day seemed mere trifles compared with her performances then of more than two hundred men on deck at least a hundred and fifty were thrown down and falling over from side to side in heaps while others holding on to the ropes swung to and fro with every heave it really appeared as if the last hour of the stout ship had come and to this minute it seems almost miraculous that her masts held on each time she fell over her main chains went deep under water the lower decks were flooded and those above could hear by the fearful crashing audible amid the hoarse roar of the storm that the coals had got loose again below and had broken into the engine room and were carrying all before them during these rolls the main deck coil shifted over to such a degree as quite to envelope four men who sitting on the top were trying to wedge it down with beams one of them was so much jammed by the mass which came over him that he was seriously contused he had to be removed to the sick bay making up the sick list to forty-five of which ten were from injuries caused by the rolling of the ship and very many of the rest from continual fatigue and exposure during the gale once round on the starboard tack and it was seen in an instant that the ship was in no degree relieved by the change another heavy sea struck her forward sweeping clean over the fore part of the vessel and carrying away the woodwork and platforms which had been placed there round the machinery for underrunning this and a few more plunges were quite sufficient to settle the matter and at last reluctantly captain preedy succumbed to the storm he could neither conquer nor contend against full steam was got on and with a foresail and a fore topsail to lift her head the agamemnon ran before the storm rolling and tumbling over the huge waves at a tremendous pace it was well for all that the wind gave this much way on her 
or her stern would infallibly have been stove in as it was a wave partly struck her on the starboard quarter smashing the quarter galley and wardroom windows on that side and sending such a sea into the wardroom itself as to literally wash two officers off a sofa on which they were resting on that side of the ship this was a kind of parting blow for the glass began to rise and the storm was evidently beginning to moderate and although the sea still ran as high as ever there was less broken water and altogether toward midday affairs assumed a better and more cheerful aspect the wardroom that afternoon was a study for an artist with its windows half darkened and smashed the sea water still slushing about in odd corners with everything that was capable of being broken strewn over the floor in pieces and some fifteen or twenty officers seated amid the ruins holding on to the deck or table with one hand while with the other they contended at a disadvantage with a tough meal the first which most had eaten for twenty-four hours little sleep had been indulged in though much lolloping about those however who had prepared themselves for a night's rest in their berths rather than at the ocean bottom had great difficulty in finding their day garments of a morning the boots especially went astray and got so hopelessly mixed that the man who could show up with both pairs of his own was indeed a man to be congratulated but all things have an end and this long gale of over a week's duration at last blew itself out and the weary ocean rocked itself to rest throughout the whole of monday the agamemnon ran before the wind which moderated so much that at four a m on tuesday her head was again put about for the second time she commenced beating up for the rendezvous then some two hundred miles further from us than when the storm was at its height on sunday morning so little was gained against this wind that friday the twenty fifth sixteen days after leaving plymouth still found us some fifty miles from rendezvous so it was determined to get up steam and run down on it at once as we approached the place of meeting the angry sea went down the valorous hove in sight at noon in the afternoon the niagara came in from the north and at eleven the gorgon from the south and then almost for the first time since starting the squadron was reunited near the spot where the great work was to have commenced fifteen days previously as tranquil in the middle of the atlantic as if in plymouth sound End of chapter 6Chapter 7 of the Story of the Atlantic Cable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright. Chapter 7 The Renewed Effort. That evening the four vessels lay together side by side, and there was such a stillness in the sea and air as would have seemed remarkable even on an inland lake. On the Atlantic, and after what had been so lately experienced, it seemed almost unnatural. The boats were out, and the officers were passing from ship to ship, telling their experiences of the voyage and forming plans for the morrow. The captain of the Agamemnon had a sorry tale to tell, the strain to which she had been subjected had opened her waterways. Then again, one of the crew, a marine, had been literally frightened out of his wits and remained crazy for some days. One man had his arm fractured in two places, and another his leg broken. The Niagara, on the other hand, had weathered the gale splendidly, though it had been a hard and anxious time with her, as well as with the smaller craft. She had lost her jib-boom, and the boys she carried for suspending the cable had been washed from her sides. No man knew where. After taking stock of things generally, a start was made to repair the various damages. 
but the shifting of the upper part of the main coil on the Agamemnon into a hopeless tangle entailed recoiling a considerable length of cable, a no light task occupying several days. On the morning of Saturday, June 26, all the preparations were completed for making the splice and once more commencing the great undertaking. In the words of the Times representative, the end of the Niagara's cable was sent on board the Agamemnon, the splice was made, a bent sixpence put in for luck, and at 2.50 Greenwich time it was slowly lowered over the side and disappeared forever. The weather was cold and foggy with a stiff breeze and dismal sort of sleet, and as there was no cheering or manifestation of enthusiasm of any kind, the whole ceremony had a most funereal effect and seemed as solemn as if it were burying a marine or some other mortuary task of the kind equally cheerful and enlivening. As it turned out, however, it was just as well that no display took place, as everyone would have looked uncommonly silly when the same operation came to be repeated as it had to be an hour or so afterward. It is needless to make a long story longer, so I may state at once that when each ship had paid out three miles or so, and they were getting well apart, the cable, which had been allowed to run too slack, broke on board the Niagara, owing to its overriding and getting off the pulley leading onto the machine. The break was of course known instantly, both vessels put about and returned, a fresh splice was made and again lowered at half-past seven. According to arrangement, 150 fathoms were veered out from each ship, and then all stood away on their course, at first at two miles an hour, and afterward at four. Everything then went well, the machine working beautifully, at 32 revolutions per minute, the screw at 26, the cable running out easily at five and five and a half miles an hour, the ship going four. The greatest strain upon the dynamometer was 2,500 pounds, and this was only for a few minutes, the average giving only 2,000 pounds and 2,100 pounds. At midnight, 21 nautical miles had been paid out, and the angle of the cable with the horizon had been reduced considerably. At about half-past three, 40 miles had gone, and nothing could be more perfect and regular than the working of everything, when suddenly, at 3.40 a.m. on Sunday, the 27th, Professor Thompson came on the deck and reported a total break of continuity, that the cable, in fact, had parted, and was believed at the time from the Niagara. The Agamemnon was instantly stopped, and the brakes applied to the machinery, in order that the cable paid out might be severed from the mass in the hold, and so enable Professor Thompson to discover by electrical tests at about what distance from the ship the fracture had taken place. Unfortunately, however, there was a strong breeze on at the time, with a rather heavy swell, which told severely upon the cable and before any means could be taken to ease entirely the motion on the ship, it parted a few fathoms below the stern wheel, the dynamometer indicating a strain of nearly 4,000 pounds. In another instant, a gun and a blue light warned the Valorous of what had happened and roused all on board the Agamemnon to a knowledge that the machinery was silent and that the first part of the Atlantic cable had been laid and effectually lost. The great length of cable on board both ships allowed a large margin for such mishaps as these, and the arrangement made before leaving England was that the splices might be renewed and the work recommenced till each ship had lost 250 miles of wire, after which they were to discontinue their efforts and return to Queenstown. Accordingly, after the breakage on Sunday morning, the ship's heads were put about and for the fourth time the Agamemnon again began the weary work of beating up against the wind for that everlasting rendezvous which we seemed destined to be always seeking. Apart from the regret with which all regarded the loss of the cable, there were other reasons for not wishing the cruise to be thus indefinitely prolonged, since there had been a break in the continuity of the fresh provisions, and for some days previously in the wardroom the pièce de résistance had been inflammatory looking more so, salted to an astonishing pitch, and otherwise uneatable, for it was beef which had been kept three years beyond its warranty for soundness, and to which all were then reduced. It was hard work beating up against the wind, so hard indeed that it was not till noon of Monday the 28th, 
that we again met the Niagara, and while all were waiting with impatience for her explanation of how she broke the cable, she electrified everyone by running up the interrogatory, how did the cable part? This was astounding. As soon as the boats could be lowered, Mr. Cyrus Field, with the electricians from the Niagara, came on board, and a comparison of logs showed the painful and mysterious fact that at the same second of time each vessel discovered that a total fracture had taken place at a distance of certainly not less than ten miles from each ship, as well as could be judged, at the bottom of the ocean. The logs on both sides were so clear as to the minute of time and as to the electrical tests showing not merely leakage or defective insulations of the wire, but a total fracture, that there was no room left on which to rest a moment's doubt of the certainty of this most disheartening fact. That, of all the many mishaps connected with the Atlantic Telegraph, this was the worst and most disheartening, since it proved that after all that human skill and science can effect to lay the wire down with safety has been accomplished, there may be some fatal obstacles to success at the bottom of the ocean which can never be guarded against, for even the nature of the peril must always remain a secret and unknown as the depths in which it is to be encountered. Was the bottom covered with a soft coating of ooze in which it had been said the cable might rest, undisturbed for years as on a bed of down, or were there after all sharp pointed rocks lying on that supposed plateau of Maury, Berryman, and Damon? These were the questions that some of those on board were asking. But there was no use in further conjecture or in repining over what had already happened. Though the prospect of success appeared to be considerably impaired, it was generally considered that there was but one course left, and that was to splice again and make another, and what was fondly hoped would be a final attempt. Accordingly, no time was lost in making the third splice, which was lowered over into 2,000 fathoms of water at 7 o'clock by a ship's time the same night. Before steaming away, as the Agamemnon was now getting very short of coal, and the two vessels had some 100 miles of surplus cable between them, it was agreed that if the wire parted again before the ships had gone each 100 miles from the rendezvous, they were to return and make another splice, and as the Agamemnon was to sail back, the Niagara, it was decided, was to wait eight days for her appearance. If, on the other hand, the 100 miles had been exceeded, the ships were not to return, but each make the best of its way to Queenstown. With this understanding, the ships again parted, and with the wire dropping steadily down between them, the Niagara and Agamemnon steamed away and were soon lost in the cold, raw fog which had hung over the rendezvous ever since the operations had commenced. The cable, as before, paid out beautifully, and nothing could have been more regular and more easy than the working of every part of the apparatus. At first the ship's speed was only two knots, the cable going three and three and a half with a strain of 1,500 pounds, the horizontal angle averaging as low as seven, and the vertical about 16. By and by, however, the speed was increased to four knots, the cable going five, at a strain of 2,000 pounds, and an angle of from 12 to 15. At this rate, it was kept with trifling variations throughout the whole of Monday night, and neither Mr. Bright, Mr. Canning, nor Mr. Clifford ever quitted the machines for an instant. Toward the middle of the night, while the rate of the ship continued the same, the speed at which the cable paid out slackened nearly a knot, while the dynamometer indicated as low as 1,300 pounds. This change could only be accounted for on the supposition that the water had shallowed to a considerable extent, and that the vessel was in fact passing over some submarine Ben Nevis or Skiddaw. After an interval of about an hour, the strain and rate of progress on the cable again increased, while the increase of the vertical angle seemed to indicate that the wire was sinking down the side of a declivity. Beyond this, there was no variation throughout Monday night, or indeed through Tuesday. The upper deck coil, which had weighed so heavily upon the ship, and still more heavily upon the minds of all during the past storms, was fast disappearing, and by twelve at midday on Tuesday, the 29th, 76 miles had been paid out to something like 60 miles progress of the ship, 
warned by repeated failures, many of those on board scarcely dared hope for success. Still, the spirits of all rose as the distance widened between the ships. Things were going in splendid style, in such splendid style that stock had gone up nearly 100%. Those who had leisure for sleep were able to dream about cable laying and the terrible effects of too great a strain. The first question which such as these ask on awakening is about the cable, and on being informed that it is all right, satisfaction ensues until the appearance of breakfast, when it is presumed this feeling is intensified. For those who do not derive any particular pleasure from the mere asking of questions, the harmonious music made by the paying-out machine during its revolutions supplies the information. Then again, the electrical continuity, after all the most important item, was perfect, and the electricians reported that the signals passing between the ships were eminently satisfactory. The door of the testing room is almost always shut, and the electricians pursue their work undisturbed, but it is impossible to exclude that spirit of scientific inquiry which will satiate its thirst for information even through a keyhole. Further, the weather was all it could be wished for. Indeed, had the poet who was so anxious for life on the ocean wave and a home on the rolling deep been aboard, he would have been absolutely happy and perhaps even more desirous for a fixed habitation. The only cause that warranted anxiety was that it was evident the upper deck coil would be finished by about eleven o'clock at night, when the men would have to pass along in darkness the great loop which formed the communication between that and the coil in the main hold. This was most unfortunate, but the operation had been successfully performed in daylight during the experimental trip in the Bay of Biscay, and every precaution was now taken that no accident should occur. At nine o'clock, by a ship's time, when 146 miles had been paid out and about 112 miles distance from the rendezvous accomplished, the last flake but one of the upper deck coil came in turn to be used. In order to make it easier in passing to the main coil, the revolutions of the screw were reduced gradually by two revolutions at a time from 30 to 20, while the paying out machine went slowly from 36 to 22. At this rate, the vessel going three knots and the cable three and a half, the operation was continued with perfect regularity the dynamometer indicating the strain of 2,100 pounds. Suddenly, without an instant's warning, or the occurrence of any single incident that could account for it, the cable parted when subjected to a strain of less than a ton. The gun that again told the valorous of this fatal mishap brought all on board the Agamemnon rushing to the deck, for none could believe the rumor that had spread like wildfire about the ship. But there stood the machinery, silent and motionless, while the fractured end of the wire hung over the stern wheel, swinging loosely to and fro. It seemed almost impossible to realize the fact that an accident so instantaneous and irremediable should have occurred, and at a time when all seemed to be going so well. Of course, a variety of ingenious suggestions were soon afloat, showing most satisfactorily how the cable must and ought to have broken. There was a regular gloom that night on board the Agamemnon, for from first to last the success of the expedition had been uppermost in the thoughts of all, and all had labored for it early and late, contending with every danger and overcoming every obstacle and disaster that had marked each day with an earnestness and devotion of purpose that is really beyond all praise. Immediately after the mishap, a brief consultation was held by those in charge on board the Agamemnon, and, as it was shown that they had only exceeded the distance from the rendezvous by fourteen miles, and that there was still more cable on board the two vessels than the amount with which the original expedition last year was commenced, it was determined to try for another chance and return to the rendezvous, sailing there, of course, for Mr. Brown, the chief engineer, as ultra-zealous in the cause as a board of directors, guarded the coal bunkers like a very dragon, lest, if in coming to paying out the cable again, steam should run short, thereby endangering the success of the whole undertaking. 
For the fifth time, therefore, the Agamemnon's head went about, and after twenty days at sea she again began beating up against the wind for the rendezvous to try, if possible, to recommence her labors. The following day the wind was blowing from the southwest with mist and rain, and Thursday, July 1st, gave everyone the most unfavorable opinion of July weather in the Atlantic. The wind and sea were both high, the wet fog so dense that one could scarcely see the mastheads, while the damp cold was really biting. Altogether it was an atmosphere of which a Londoner would have been ashamed, even in November. Later in the day, a heavy sea got on, the wind increased without dissipating the fog, and it was double-reefed topsails, with pitching and rolling as before. However, the upper deck coil of 250 tons being gone, the Agamemnon was as buoyant as a lifeboat, and no one cared how much she took to kicking about, though the cold-wet fog was a miserable nuisance, penetrating everywhere and making the ship wet inside as out. What made the matter worse was that in such weather there seemed no chance of meeting the Niagara unless she ran into us, when cable-laying would have gone on wholesale. In order to avoid such a contretemps, and also to inform the valorous of our whereabouts, guns were fired, fog-bells rung, and the bugler stationed forward to warn the other vessels of our vicinity. Friday was the ditto of Thursday, and Saturday worse than both together, for it almost blew a gale, and there was a heavy sea on. On Sunday the 4th it cleared, and the Agamemnon, for the first time during the whole cruise, reached the actual rendezvous and fell in with the Valorous, which had been there since Friday the 2nd, but the fog must have been even thicker there than elsewhere, for she had scarcely seen herself, much less anything else, till Sunday. During the remainder of that day and Monday, when the weather was very clear, both ships cruised over the place of meeting, but neither the Niagara nor Gorgon was there, though day and night the lookout for them was constant and incessant. It was evident, then, that the Niagara had rigidly, but most unfortunately, adhered to the mere letter of the agreement regarding the one hundred miles, and after the last fracture had at once turned back for Queenstown. On Tuesday the sixth, therefore, as the dense fogs and winds set in again, it was agreed between the Valorous and the Agamemnon to return once more to the rendezvous. But as usual the fog was so thick that the whole American navy might have been cruising there unobserved, so the search was given up, and at eight o'clock that night the ship's head was turned for cork, and under all sail the Agamemnon at last stood homeward. The voyage home was made with ease and swiftness, considering the lightness of the wind, the trim of the ship, and that she had only steamed three days, and at midday on Tuesday, July 12th, the Agamemnon cast anchor in Queenstown Harbor, having met with more dangerous weather and encountered more mishaps than often falls the lot of any ship in a cruise of thirty-three days. Thus ends the most arduous and dangerous expedition that has ever been experienced in connection with cable work. It, at any rate, had the advantage of supplying the public with some exciting reading in the columns of the Times, whose graphic descriptions were much appreciated. The Niagara had reached Queenstown as far back as July 5th, Having found that they had run out 109 miles when continuity ceased, those in charge considered that, in order to carry out their instructions, they should return at once to the above port, which they did. On the two ships meeting at Queenstown, discussion immediately took place as to the cause of the cessation of continuity, and regarding the course taken by the Niagara in returning home so promptly. The non-arrival of the Agamemnon till nearly a week later had been the cause of much alarm regarding her safety. End of chapter 7 Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec Chapter 8 of The Story of the Atlantic Cable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Sir Charles Bright Chapter 8 Finis Coronat Opus The sad tale of disaster commenced to spread abroad immediately on the Niagara's arrival in Queenstown. 
and when Mr. Field hastened to London to meet the other directors of the company, he found that the news had not only preceded him, but had already had its effect. The board was soon called together. It met as a council of war, summoned after a terrific defeat, to decide whether to surrender, or to try once more the chances of battle. Says Field, most of the directors looked blankly in one another's faces. With some the feeling was one akin to despair. It was thought by many that there was nothing left on which to found an expectation of future success, or to encourage the expenditure of further capital upon an adventure so completely visionary. The chairman, Sir William Brown, while recommending entire abandonment of the undertaking, suggested a sale of the cable remaining on board the ships, and a distribution of the proceeds among the shareholders. Bolder counsels were, however, destined to prevail. There were those who thought there was still a chance, like Robert Bruce, who, after twelve battles and twelve defeats, yet believed that a thirteenth might bring victory, notwithstanding the prejudice held by some against that number. The projectors made a firm stand for immediate action, as did also Professor Thompson and Mr. Curtis Lampson, who succeeded Mr. Brooking as deputy chairman, at the same time that Mr. Stuart Wortley took the chair, in place of Sir W. Brown, on the latter's resignation. These advocates of non-surrender succeeded at length in carrying an order for the immediate sailing of the expedition for a final effort. It was this effort which proved to the world the possibility of telegraphing from one hemisphere to the other. The order to advance having been given, the ships forthwith took in coal and other necessaries. When everything and everybody had been shipped, the squadron left Queenstown once more on Saturday, July 17, 1858. As the ships sailed out of the harbor of Cork, it was with none of the enthusiasm which attended their departure from Valentia the year before, or even the small amount excited when leaving Plymouth on June 10th nobody so much as cheered. In fact, their mission was by this time spoken of as a mad freak of stubborn ignorance, which was regarded with mixed feelings of derision and pity. The squadron was the same as on the last occasion. It was agreed that the ships should not attempt to keep together this time, but that each should make its way to the given latitude and longitude. The staffs were composed and berthed as before. Moreover, the expedition was again accompanied by the same literary talent. THE LAST START Let us now turn to the Times narrative, as was given at the conclusion of this final expedition. As the ships left the harbor, there was apparently no notice taken of their departure by those on shore or in the vessels anchored around them. Everyone seemed impressed with the conviction that we were engaged in a hopeless enterprise— and the squadron seemed rather to have slunk away on some discreditable mission than to have sailed for the accomplishment of a grand national scheme. It was just dawn when the Agamemnon got clear of Queenstown Harbor, but as the wind blew stiff from the southwest it was nearly ten o'clock before she rounded the old head of Kinsale, a distance of only a few miles. The weather remained fine during the day, and as the Agamemnon skirted along the wild and rocky shore of the southwest coast of Ireland, those on board had an excellent opportunity of seeing the stupendous rocks which rise from the water in the most grotesque and fantastic shapes. About five o'clock in the afternoon Cape Clear was passed, and though the coast gradually edged away to the northward of our course— yet it was nearly dark before we lost sight of the rocky mountains which surround Bantry Bay and the shores of the Kenmare River. By Monday the 19th we had left the land far behind us, and thence fell into the usual dull monotony of sea life. Of the voyage out there is little to be said. It was not checkered by the excitement of continual storms or the tedium of perpetual calms, but we had a sufficient admixture of both to render our passage to the rendezvous a very ordinary and uninteresting one. For the first week the barometer remained unusually low, and the numbers of those natural barometers, Mother Carey's chickens, that kept in our wake, kept us in continual expectation of heavy weather. With very little breeze or wind, the screw was got up and sail made, so as to husband our coals as much as possible— 
but it generally soon fell calm and obliged Captain Preedy reluctantly to get up steam again. In consequence of continued delays and changes from steam to sail and from sail to steam again, much fuel was expended, and not more than eighty miles of distance made good each day. On Sunday the 25th, however, the weather changed, and for several days in succession there was an uninterrupted calm. The moon was just at the full, and for several nights it shone with a brilliancy which turned the smooth sea into one silvery sheet, which brought out the dark hull and white sails of the ship in strong contrast to the sea and sky, as the vessel lay all but motionless on the water, the very impersonation of solitude and repose. Indeed, until the rendezvous was gained, we had such a succession of beautiful sunrises, gorgeous sunsets, and tranquil moonlight nights, as would have excited the most enthusiastic admiration of any one but persons situated as we were. But by us such scenes were regarded only as the annoying indications of the calm which delayed our progress and wasted our coal. To say that it was calm was not doing full justice to it. There was not a breath in the air and the water was as smooth as a mill-pond. Even the wake of the ship scarce ruffled the surface, and the gulls which had visited us almost daily, and to which our benevolent liberality had dispensed innumerable pieces of pork, threw an almost unbroken shadow upon it, as they stooped in their flight to pick up the largest and most tempting. It was generally remarked that cable-laying under such circumstances would be mere child's play. In spite of the unusual calmness of the weather in general, there were days on which our former unpleasant experiences of the Atlantic were brought forcibly to our recollection, when it blew hard and the sea ran sufficiently high to reproduce on a minor scale some of the discomforts of which the previous cruise had been so fruitful. Those days, however, were the exception and not the rule, and served to show how much more pleasant was the inconvenient calm than the weather which had previously prevailed. The precise point of the rendezvous, marked by a dot on the chart, was reached on the evening of Wednesday, July 28th, just eleven days after our departure from Queenstown. The voyage out was a lazy one. Now things are different, and we no longer hear of the prospects of the heroes and heroines of the romances and novels which have formed the staple food for animated discussion for some days past. The rest of the squadron were in sight at nightfall, but at such a considerable distance that it was past ten o'clock on the morning of Thursday the twenty-ninth before the Agamemnon joined them. Some time previous to reaching the rendezvous, the engineer-in-chief, Mr. Bright, went up in the shrouds on the lookout for the other ships, and accordingly had to pay his footing, much to the amusement of his staff. Most of them, being more advanced in years, would not probably have been so equal to the task in an athletic sense. After the ordinary laconic conversation which characterized code flag signals, we were as usual greeted by a perfect storm of questions as to what had kept us so much behind our time, and learned that all had come to the conclusion that the ship must have got on shore on leaving Queenstown Harbor. The Niagara, it appeared, had arrived at the rendezvous on Friday night the 23rd, the Valorous on Sunday the 25th, and the Gorgon on the afternoon of Tuesday the 27th. The day was beautifully calm, so no time was to be lost before making the splice at latitude 52 degrees 9 minutes north, longitude 32 degrees 27 minutes west, and soundings of 1,500 fathoms. Boats were soon lowered from the attendant ships, the two vessels made fast by a hawser, and the Niagara's end of the cable conveyed on board the Agamemnon. About half-past twelve o'clock the splice was effectually made, but with a very different frame from the carefully rounded semicircular boards which had been used to enclose the junctions on previous occasions. It consisted merely of two straight boards hauled over the joint and splice, with the iron rod and leaden plummet attached to the center. In hoisting it out from the side of the ship, however, the leaden sinker broke short off and fell overboard. There being no more convenient weight at hand, a thirty-two-pound shot was fastened to the splice instead, and the whole apparatus was quickly dropped into the sea without any formality, and indeed almost without a spectator, 
for those on board the ship had witnessed so many beginnings to the telegraphic line that it was evident they despaired of there ever being an end to it the stipulated two hundred ten fathoms of cable having been paid out to allow the splice to sink well below the surface the signal to start was hoisted the hawser cut loose and the niagara and agamemnon start for the last time at about one p m for their opposite destinations the announcement comes from the electrician's testing room that the continuity is perfect and with this assurance the engineers go on more boldly with their work in point of fact the engineers may be said to be very much under the control of the electricians during the paying out for if the latter report anything wrong with the cable the engineers are brought to a stand until they are allowed to go on with their operations by the announcement of the electricians that the insulation is perfect and the continuity all right the testing room is where the subtle current which flows along the conductor is generated and where the mysterious apparatus by which electricity is weighed and measured as a marketable commodity is fitted up the system of testing and of transmitting and receiving signals through the cable from ship to ship during the process of paying out must now be briefly referred to it consists of an exchange of current sent alternately every ten minutes by each ship these not only serve to give an accurate test of the continuity and insulation of the conducting wire from end to end but also give certain signals which it is desirable to send for information purposes for instance every ten miles of cable paid out is signalized from ship to ship as also the approach to land or momentary stoppage for splicing shifting to a fresh coil etc the current in its passage is made to pass through an electromagnetometer an instrument invented by mr whitehouse it is also conveyed in its passage at each end of the cable through the reflecting galvanometer and speaking instrument just invented by professor thompson and it is this latter which is so invaluable not only for the interchange of signals but also for testing purposes the deflections read on the galvanometer as also the degree of change and discharge indicated by the magnetometer are carefully recorded thus if a defect of continuity or insulation occurs it is brought to light by comparison with those received before for the first three hours the ships proceeded very slowly paying out a great quantity of slack but after the expiration of this time the speed of the agamemnon was increased to about five knots the cable going at about six without indicating more than a few hundred pounds of strain upon the dynamometer shortly after four o'clock a very large whale was seen approaching the starboard bow at a great speed rolling and tossing the sea into foam all round and for the first time we felt a possibility for the supposition that our second mysterious breakage of the cable might have been caused after all by one of these animals getting foul of it under the water it appeared as if it were making direct for the cable and great was the relief of all when the ponderous living mass was seen slowly to pass astern just grazing the cable where it entered the water but fortunately without doing any mischief all seemed to go well up to about eight o'clock the cable paid out from the hold with an evenness and regularity which showed how carefully and perfectly it had been coiled away the paying out machine also worked so smoothly that it left nothing to be desired the brakes are properly called self-releasing and although they can by means of additional weights be made to increase the pressure or strain upon the cable yet until these weights are still further increased at the engineer's instructions it is impossible to augment the strain in any other way to guard against accidents which might arise in consequence of the cable having suffered injury during the storm the indicated strain upon the dynamometer was never allowed to go beyond one thousand seven hundred pounds or less than one quarter what the cable is estimated to bear thus far everything looked promising but in such a hazardous work no one knows what a few minutes may bring forth for soon after eight o'clock an injured portion of the cable was discovered about a mile or two from the portion paying out not a moment was lost by mr canning the engineer on duty in setting men to work to cobble up the injury as well as time would permit 
for the cable was going out at such a rate that the damaged portion would be paid overboard in less than twenty minutes and former experience had shown us that to check either the speed of the ship or the cable would in all probability be attended by the most fatal results just before the lapping was finished professor thompson reported that the electrical continuity of the wire had ceased but that the insulation was still perfect attention was naturally directed to the injured place as the probable source of the stoppage and not a moment was lost in cutting the cable at that point with the intention of making a perfect splice to the consternation of all the electrical tests applied showed the fault to be overboard and in all probability some fifty miles from the ship not a second was to be lost for it was evident that the cut portion must be paid overboard in a few minutes and in the meantime the tedious and difficult operation of making a splice had to be performed the ship was immediately stopped and no more cable paid out than was absolutely necessary to prevent it breaking as the stern of the ship was lifted by the waves a scene of the most intense excitement followed it seemed impossible even by using the greatest possible speed and paying out the least possible amount of cable that the junction could be finished before the part was taken out of the hands of the workmen the main hold presented an extraordinary scene nearly all the officers of the ship and of those connected with the expedition stood in groups about the coil watching with intense anxiety the cable as it slowly unwound itself nearer and nearer to the joint while the workmen worked at the splice as only men could work who felt that the life and death of the expedition depended upon their rapidity but all their speed was to no purpose as the cable was unwinding within a hundred fathoms and as a last and desperate resource the cable was stopped altogether and for a few minutes the ship hung on by the end fortunately however it was only for a few minutes as the strain was continually rising above two tons and it would not hold on much longer when the splice was finished the signal was made to loose the stoppers and it passed overboard in safety when the excitement consequent upon having so narrowly saved the cable had passed away we awoke to the consciousness that the case was yet as hopeless as ever for the electrical continuity was still entirely wanting preparations were consequently made to pay out as little rope as possible and to hold on for six hours in the hope that the fault whatever it was might mend itself before cutting the cable and returning to the rendezvous to make another splice the magnetic needles on the receiving instruments were watched closely for the returning signals when in a few minutes the last hope was extinguished by their suddenly indicating dead earth which tended to show that the cable had broken from the niagara or that the insulation had been completely destroyed nothing however could be done the only course was to wait until the current should return or take its final departure and it did return with greater strength than ever for in three minutes every one was agreeably surprised by the intelligence that the stoppage had disappeared and that the signals had again appeared at their regular intervals from the niagara it is needless to say what a load of anxiety this news removed from the minds of every one but the general confidence in the ultimate success of the operations was much shaken by the occurrence for all felt that any minute a similar accident might occur for some time the paying out continued as usual but toward the morning another damaged place was discovered in the cable there was fortunately time however to repair it in the hold without in any way interfering with the operations beyond for a time reducing slightly the speed of the ship during the morning of friday the thirtieth everything went well the ship had been kept at the speed of about five knots the cable going out at six the average angle with the horizon at which it left the ship being about fifteen degrees while the indicated strain upon the dynamometer seldom showed more than sixteen hundred pounds to seventeen hundred pounds observations made at noon showed that we had made good ninety miles from the starting point since the previous day with an expenditure including the loss in lowering the splice and during the subsequent stoppages of a hundred and thirty five miles of cable during the latter portion of the day the barometer fell considerably 
and toward the evening it blew almost a gale of wind from the eastward dead ahead of our course as the breeze freshened the speed of the engines was gradually increased but the wind more than increased in proportion so that before the sun went down the agamemnon was going full steam against the wind only making a speed of about four knots during the evening topmasts were lowered and spars yards sails indeed everything aloft that could offer resistance to the wind were sent down on deck still the ship made but little way chiefly in consequence of the heavy sea though the enormous quantity of fuel consumed showed us that if the wind lasted we should be reduced to burning the masts spars and even the decks to bring the ship into valentia it seemed to be our particular ill fortune to meet with head winds whichever way the ship's head was turned on our journey out we had been delayed and obliged to consume an undue proportion of coal for want of an easterly wind and now all our fuel was wanted because of one however during the next day the wind gradually went round to the southwest which though it raised a very heavy sea allowed us to husband our small remaining store of fuel at noon on saturday july thirty first observations showed us to be in latitude fifty two degrees twenty three minutes north and longitude twenty six degrees forty four minutes west having made good one hundred and twenty miles of distance since noon of the previous day with a loss of about twenty seven per cent of cable the niagara as far as could be judged from the amount of cable she paid out which by a previous arrangement was signalled every ten miles kept pace with us within one or two miles the whole distance across during the afternoon of saturday the wind again freshened up and before nightfall it blew nearly a gale of wind and a tremendous sea ran before it from the southwest which made the agamemnon pitch and toss to such an extent that it was thought impossible the cable could hold through the night indeed had it not been for the constant care and watchfulness exercised by mr bright and the two energetic engineers mr canning and mr clifford who acted with him it could not have been done at all men were kept at the wheels of the machine to prevent their stopping as the stern of the ship rose and fell with the sea for had they done so the cable must undoubtedly have parted during sunday the sea and wind increased and before evening it blew a smart gale now indeed were the energy and activity of all engaged in the operation tasked to the utmost mr hoare and mr moore the two engineers who had the charge of the relieving wheels of the dynamometer had to keep watch and watch alternately every four hours and while on duty durst not let their attention be removed from their occupation for one moment for on their releasing the brakes every time the stern of the ship fell into the trough of the sea entirely depended the safety of the cable and the result shows how ably they discharged their duty throughout the night there were few who had the least expectation of the cable holding on till morning and many lay awake listening for the sound that all most dreaded to hear namely the gun which should announce the failure of all our hopes but still the cable which in comparison with the ship from which it was paid out and the gigantic waves among which it was delivered was but a mere thread continued to hold on only leaving a silvery phosphorescent line upon the stupendous seas as they rolled on toward the ship with sunday morning came no improvement in the weather still the sky remained black and stormy to windward and the constant violent squalls of wind and rain which prevailed during the whole day served to keep up if not to augment the height of the waves but the cable had gone through so much during the night that our confidence in its continuing to hold was much restored at noon observation showed us to be in latitude fifty two degrees twenty six minutes north and longitude twenty three degrees sixteen minutes west having made good one hundred and thirty miles from noon of the previous day and about three hundred fifty from our starting point in mid-ocean we had passed by the deepest soundings of two thousand four hundred fathoms and over more than half of the deep water generally while the amount of cable still remaining in the ship was more than sufficient to carry us to the irish coast even supposing the continuance of the bad weather should oblige us to pay out nearly the same amount of slack cable as hitherto thus far things looked promising for our ultimate success 
but former experience showed us only too plainly that we could never suppose that some accident might not arise until the ends had been fairly landed on the opposite shores. During Sunday night and Monday morning the weather continued as boisterous as ever. It was only by the most indefatigable exertions of the engineer upon duty that the wheels could be prevented from stopping altogether as the vessel rose and fell with the sea, and once or twice they did come completely to a standstill, in spite of all that could be done to keep them moving. Fortunately, however, they were again set in motion before the stern of the ship was thrown by the succeeding wave. No strain could be placed upon the cable, of course, and though the dynamometer occasionally registered seventeen hundred pounds as the ship lifted, it was oftener below one thousand pounds, and was frequently nothing, the cable running out as fast as its own weight and the speed of the ship could draw it. But even with all these forces acting unresistingly upon it, the cable never paid itself out at a greater speed than eight knots at the time the ship was going at the rate of six knots and a half. Subsequently, however, when the speed of the ship even exceeded six knots and a half, the cable never ran out so quickly. The average speed maintained by the ship up to this time, and indeed for the whole voyage, was about five knots and a half, the cable, with occasional exceptions, running some thirty per cent faster. At noon on Monday, August 2nd, observations showed us to be in latitude 52 degrees 35 minutes north, longitude 19 degrees 48 minutes west. Thus we had made good 127 and a half miles since noon of the previous day, and had completed more than halfway to our ultimate destination. During the afternoon an American three-masted schooner, which afterward proved to be the chieftain, was seen standing from the eastward toward us. No notice was taken of her at first but when she was within about half a mile of the Agamemnon, she altered her course and bore right down across our bows. A collision which might prove fatal to the cable now seemed inevitable, or could only be avoided by the equally hazardous expedient of altering the Agamemnon's course. The Valorous steamed ahead and fired a gun for her to heave to, which, as she did not appear to take much notice of, was quickly followed by another from the bows of the Agamemnon, and a second and third from the Valorous. But still the vessel held on her course, and as the only resource left to avoid a collision, the course of the Agamemnon was altered, just in time to pass within a few yards of her. It was evident that our proceedings were a source of the greatest possible astonishment to them, for all her crew crowded upon her deck and rigging. At length they evidently discovered who we were and what we were doing, for the crew manned the rigging, and dipping the ensign several times, they gave us three hearty cheers. Though the Agamemnon was obliged to acknowledge these congratulations in due form, the feeling of annoyance with which we regarded this vessel, which either by the stupidity or carelessness of those on board, was so near to adding a fatal and unexpected mishap to the long chapter of accidents which had already been encountered, may easily be imagined. To those below, who of course did not see the ship approaching, the sound of the first gun came like a thunderbolt, for all took it as a signal of the breaking of the cable. The dinner-tables were deserted in a moment, and a general rush made up the hatches to the deck. But before reaching it their fears were quickly banished by the report of the succeeding gun, which all knew well could only be caused by a ship in our way or a man overboard. Throughout the greater part of Monday morning the electrical signals from the Niagara had been getting gradually weaker, until they ceased altogether for nearly three-quarters of an hour. Then Professor Thompson sent a message to the effect that the signals were too weak to be read, and in a little while the deflections returned even stronger than they had ever been before. Toward evening, however, they again declined in force for a few minutes. With the exception of these little stoppages, the electrical condition of the submerged wire seemed to be much improved. It was evident that the low temperature of the water, at the immense depth, improved considerably the insulating properties of the gutta percha, while the enormous pressure to which it must have been subjected probably tended to consolidate its texture and to fill up any air bubbles or slight faults in manufacture which may have existed. 
The weather during Monday night moderated a little, but still there was a very heavy sea on, which endangered the wire every second minute. About three o'clock on Tuesday morning, all on board were startled from their beds by the loud booming of a gun. Everyone, without waiting for the performance of the most particular toilette, rushed on deck to ascertain the cause of the disturbance. Contrary to all expectation, the cable was safe. But just in the gray light could be seen the valorous, rounded to in a most warlike attitude, firing gun after gun in quick succession toward a large American bark, which, quite unconscious of our proceedings, was standing right across our stern. Such loud and repeated remonstrances from a large steam frigate were not to be despised, and evidently without knowing the why or the wherefore, she quickly threw her sails back and remained hove to. Whether those on board her considered that we were engaged in some filibustering expedition, or regarded our proceedings as another outrage upon the American flag, it is impossible to say. But certain it is that, apparently in great trepidation, she remained hove to until we had lost sight of her in the distance. Tuesday was a much finer day than any we had experienced for nearly a week, but still there was a considerable sea running, and our dangers were far from past. Yet the hopes of our ultimate success ran high. We had accomplished nearly the whole of the deep portions of the route in safety, and that, too, under the most unfavorable circumstances possible. Therefore there was every reason to believe that unless some unforeseen accident should occur, we should accomplish the remainder. Observations at noon placed us in latitude 52 degrees 26 minutes north, longitude 16 degrees 7 minutes 40 seconds west, having run 134 miles since the previous day. About five o'clock in the evening, the steep submarine mountain, which divides the steep telegraphic plateau from the Irish coast, was reached, and the sudden shallowing of water had a very marked effect upon the cable, causing the strain and the speed to lessen every minute. A great deal of slack was paid out, to allow for any greater inequalities which might exist, though undiscovered by the sounding line. About ten o'clock the shoal water of two hundred fifty fathoms was reached. The only remaining anxiety now was the changing from the lower main coil to that upon the upper deck, and this most dangerous operation was successfully performed between three and four o'clock on Wednesday morning. Wednesday was a beautiful, calm day. Indeed, it was the first on which any one would have thought of making a splice since the day we started from the rendezvous. We therefore congratulated ourselves on having saved a week by commencing operations on the Thursday previous. At noon we were in latitude 52 degrees 11 minutes, longitude 12 degrees 40 minutes 2 seconds west, 89 miles distant from the telegraph station at Valentia. The water was shallow, so that there was no difficulty in paying out the wire almost without any loss by slack and all looked upon the undertaking as virtually accomplished. At about one o'clock in the evening, the second change from the upper deck coil to that upon the orlop deck was safely effected, and shortly after the vessels exchanged signals that they were in two hundred fathoms water. As night advanced, the speed of the ship was reduced, as it was known that we were only a short distance from the land, and there would be no advantage in making it before daylight in the morning. At about twelve o'clock, however, the Skellig's light was seen in the distance, and the Valorous steamed on ahead to lead us into the coast, firing rockets at intervals to direct us, which were answered by us from the Agamemnon, though, according to Mr. Moriarty, the master's wish, the ship, disregarding the Valorous, kept her own course, which proved to be the right one in the end. By daylight on the morning of Thursday the 5th, the bold rocky mountains which entirely surround the wild and picturesque neighborhood of Valentia rose right before us at a few miles' distance. Never, probably, was the sight of land more welcome, as it brought to a successful termination one of the greatest, but at the same time most difficult, schemes which was ever undertaken. Had it been the dullest and most melancholy swamp on the face of the earth that lay before us, we should have found it a pleasant prospect. But as the sun rose behind the estuary of Dingle Bay, tinging with a soft, deep purple the lofty summits of the steep mountains which surround its shores, 
illuminating the masses of morning vapor which hung upon them it was a scene which might vie in beauty with anything that could be produced by the most florid imagination of an artist successful termination no one on shore was apparently conscious of our approach so the valorous went ahead to the mouth of the harbor and fired a gun both ships made straight for Dulles bay the agamemnon steaming into the harbor with a feeling that she had done something and about six a m came to anchor at the side of begenish island opposite to valentia as soon as the inhabitants became aware of our approach there was a general desertion of the place and hundreds of boats crowded round us their passengers in the greatest state of excitement to hear all about our voyage the knight of kerry was absent in dingle but a messenger was immediately dispatched for him and he soon arrived in her majesty's gunboat shamrock soon after our arrival a signal was received from the niagara that they were preparing to land having paid out one thousand thirty nautical miles of cable while the agamemnon had accomplished her portion of the distance with an expenditure of one thousand twenty miles making the total length of the wire submerged two thousand fifty geographical miles immediately after the ships cast anchor the paddle-box boats of the valorous were got ready and two miles of cable coiled away in them for the purpose of landing the end but it was late in the afternoon before the procession of boats left the ship under a salute of three rounds of small arms from the detachment of marines on board the agamemnon under the command of lieutenant morris the progress of the end to the shore was very slow in consequence of the stiff wind which blew at the time but at about three p m the end was safely brought on shore at knightstown valentia by mr bright to whose exertions the success of the undertaking is attributable mr bright was accompanied by mr canning and the knight of kerry the end was immediately laid in the trench which had been dug to receive it while a royal salute making the neighboring rocks and mountains reverberate announced that the communication between the old and new world had been completed the cable was taken into the electrical room by mr whitehouse and attached to a galvanometer and the first message was received through the entire length now lying on the bed of the sea too much praise cannot be bestowed upon both the officers and men of the agamemnon for the hearty way in which they assisted in the arduous and difficult service they have been engaged in and the admirable manner in which the ship was navigated by mr moriarty materially reduced the difficulty of the company's operations it will in all probability be nearly a fortnight before the instruments are connected at the two termini for the transmission of regular messages it is unnecessary here to expatiate upon the magnitude of the undertaking which has just been completed or upon the great political and social results which are likely to accrue from it but there can be but one feeling of universal admiration for the courage and perseverance which have been displayed by mr bright and those who acted under his orders in encountering the manifold difficulties which arose on their path at every step the american end in contradistinction to the heavy seas and difficulties the agamemnon had to contend with her consort the niagara experienced very quiet weather and her part of the work was comparatively uneventful with the exception of a fault near the bottom of the wardroom coil this was detected during the operations on the night of august second but was removed before it was paid out into the sea about four o'clock the next morning the continuity and insulation was accordingly restored and says mr mullally the new york herald correspondent on board all was going on as if nothing had occurred to disturb the confidence we felt in the success of the expedition when nearing the end various icebergs were met with some a hundred feet high Mullally dilates on their castle-like form and the effective appearance of the sun's rays thereon. Shortly after entering Trinity Bay, Newfoundland, the Niagara was met by HMS Porcupine, which had been sent out from England at the very beginning of the 1858 expedition to await her arrival and render any assistance which might be required. The Niagara anchored about 1 a.m. on August 5th, having completed her work and during the forenoon of that day the cable was landed in a little bay bull arm at the head of trinity bay 
when they received very strong currents of electricity through the whole cable from the other side of the Atlantic. The telegraph house at the Newfoundland end was some two miles from the beach, and connected to the cable by a landline. End of chapter 8 Recording by Maria Casper Chapter 9 of the Story of the Atlantic Cable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Story of the Atlantic Cable by Charles Bright. Chapter 9 The Celebration. On landing at Valentia, the engineer in chief at once sent the following startling but welcome message to his board which was at once passed on to the press. Charles Bright, to the directors of the Atlantic Telegraph Company. Valentia, August 5th. The Agamemnon has arrived at Valentia, and we are about to land the end of the cable. The Niagara is in Trinity Bay, Newfoundland. There are good signals between the ships. We reached the rendezvous on the night of the 28th, and the splice with the Niagara cable was made on board the Agamemnon the following morning. By noon on the 30th, nautical miles were laid between the ships. On the 31st, 540. On the 1st, August, 884. On the 2nd, 1,256. On the 4th, 1,854. On anchoring at 6 in the morning in Dulles Bay, 2,022. The speed of the Niagara during the whole time has been nearly the same as ours the length of cable paid out from the two ships being generally within ten miles of each other. With the exception of yesterday, the weather has been very unfavorable. On the afternoon of Thursday, August 5th, as already described in the Times report, Bright and his staff brought to shore the end of the cable at White Strand Bay, near Knightstown, Valentia, in the boats of the Valorous, welcomed by the united cheers of the small crowd assembled, Taken entirely by surprise, all England applauded the triumph of such undaunted perseverance and the engineering and nautical skill displayed in this victory over the elements. The Atlantic Telegraph had been justly characterized as the great feat of the century, and this was re-echoed by all the press on its realization. The following extracts from the leading article of the Times the day after completion is an example of the comments upon the achievement. Mr. Bright, having landed the end of the Atlantic cable at Valentia, has brought to a successful termination his anxious and difficult task of linking the old world with the new, thereby annihilating space. Since the discovery of Columbus, nothing has been done in any degree comparable to the vast enlargement which has thus been given to the sphere of human activity. The rejoicing in America, both in public and private, knew no bounds. The astounding news of the success of this unparalleled enterprise, after such combats with storm and sea, created universal enthusiasm, exultation, and joy, such as was, perhaps, never before produced by any event, not even the discovery of the Western Hemisphere. Many had predicted its failure, some from ignorance, others simply because they were anti-progressive by nature philanthropists everywhere hailed it as the greatest event of modern times heralding the good time coming of universal peace and brotherhood in newfoundland mr field together with mr bright's assistant engineers messrs everett and woodhouse and the electricians messrs de Sauty and laws received the heartiest congratulations and welcome from the governor and legislative council of the colony while acknowledging these congratulations, Mr. Field remarked, We have had many difficulties to surmount, many discouragements to bear, and some enemies to overcome, whose very opposition has stimulated us to greater exertion. It was a curious coincidence that the cable was successfully completed to Valentia on the same day in 1858 on which the shore end had been landed the year before. Moreover, it was exactly 111 years since Dr., afterward Sir William Watson, had astonished the scientific world by sending an electric current through a wire two miles long, using the earth as a return circuit. 
it is also worthy of note that the first feat of telegraphy was executed by order of king agamemnon to his queen announcing the fall of troy one thousand eighty four years before the birth of christ and that the great feat which we have narrated was carried out by the great ship agamemnon as has been here shown mr bright and messrs canning and clifford and the rest of the staff as well as professor thompson and the electricians were absolutely exhausted with the incessant watching and almost unbearable anxiety attending their arduous travail valentia provided a haven of rest indeed for these toilers of the deep completely knocked up with their experiences on the atlantic not to mention their previous trials and disappointments then came a series of banquets which had to be gone through soon after his duties in valentia were over bright made his way to dublin here he was entertained by the lord mayor and the civic authorities of that capital on wednesday september first on this occasion cardinal wiseman who was present made an eloquent speech and the following account of the proceedings from the morning post may be suitably quoted the banquet given on wednesday the first by the lord mayor of dublin to mr c t bright engineer-in-chief to the atlantic telegraph company was a great success the assemblage embraced the highest names in the metropolis civil military and official cardinal wiseman was present in full cardinalite costume the usual toasts were given and received with all honors the lord mayor in proposing the toast of the evening the health of mr bright dwelt with much eloquence on the achievements of science and paid a marked and merited compliment to the genius and perseverance which in the face of discouragement from the scientific world had succeeded in bringing about the accomplishment of the great undertaking of the laying of the atlantic telegraph his lordship's speech was most eloquent and highly complimentary to the distinguished guest mr c t bright mr bright arose amid loud cheers to respond he thanked the assemblage for their hearty welcome and said he was deeply sensible of the honor of having his name associated with the great work of the atlantic telegraph he next commented upon the value of this means of communication for the prevention of misunderstanding between the governments of the great powers and then referred to the services of the gentlemen who had been associated with him in laying the cable with whom he shared the honors done him that night mr bright was warmly cheered throughout this eloquent speech his eminence the cardinal descanted in glowing terms on the new achievement of science brought to a successful issue under the able superintendence of mr bright he warmly eulogized that gentleman's modest appreciation of his services to the world of commerce and to international communication in general charles bright was honored with a knighthood within a few days of landing as this was considered a special occasion and as queen victoria was at that time abroad the ceremony was performed there and then by his excellency the lord lieutenant of ireland on behalf of her majesty bright was but twenty-six years of age at the time being the youngest man who had received the distinction for generations past and no similar instance has since occurred moreover it was the first title conferred on the telegraphic or electrical profession and remained so for many years with professor thompson and other colleagues sir charles bright was right royally entertained in dublin killarney and elsewhere the lord lieutenant taking a prominent part in the celebrations on the occasion of the killarney banquet his excellency made the following remarks apropos of the cable and its engineers when we consider the extraordinary undertaking that has been accomplished within the last few weeks when we consider that a cable of about two thousand miles has been extended beneath the ocean a length which if multiplied ten times would reach our farthest colonies and nearly surround the earth when we consider it is stretched along a bed of shingles and shells which appeared destined for it as a foundation by providence and stretching from the points which human enterprise would look to and when we consider the great results that will flow from the enterprise we are at a loss here how to sufficiently admire the genius and energy of those who planned it or how to be sufficiently thankful to the almighty for having delegated such a power to the human race for whose benefit it is to be put in force cheers 
let us look at the career which this telegraph has passed since it was first discovered at first it was rapidly laid over the land uniting states communities and countries extending over hills and valleys roads and railways but the sea appeared to present an impenetrable barrier it could not stop here however submarine telegraphy was but a question of time and the first enterprise by which it was introduced was in connection with an old foe and at present our best friend imperial france hear hear the next attempt which was successful was the junction of england and our island and which was i believe carried out by the same distinguished engineer sir charles bright whose name is now on the mouth of every man hear hear other submarine attempts followed the telegraph paused before the great atlantic like another alexander weeping as if it had no more worlds to conquer but it has found another world and has gained it not bringing strife or conquest but carrying with it peace and good will applause i feel i should be wanting if i did not allude in terms of admiration to the genius and skill of the engineer sir charles bright who has carried out this enterprise and to the zeal and courage of those who brought it to a successful termination applause it is not necessary i am certain to call attention to the diligence and attention shown by the crew of the agamemnon cheers because i am sure there is no one here who has not read the description of that voyage in the newspapers the zeal and enterprise were only to be equalled by the skill with which it was carried out i believe there was only a difference of twelve miles between the two ends of the cable when it came to shore there are some questions with regard to the date at which the work was carried out to which i wish to call attention it was on the fifth of august eighteen fifty seven that this enterprise was first commenced under the auspices of my distinguished predecessor who i wish was here now to rejoice in its success i mean only in a private capacity cheers and laughter it was on the fifth august eighteen fifty eight that it was completed and it was on the fifth august more than three hundred years ago that columbus left the shores of spain to proceed on his ever memorable voyage to america it was on the fifth of august fifteen eighty three that sir hugh gilbert a worthy countryman of raleigh and drake steered his good ship the squirrel to the shores of newfoundland and first unfurled the flag of england in the very bay where this triumph has now taken place applause and it was on the same fifth of august that your sovereign was received by her imperial friend amid the fortifications of cherbourg and thereby put an end to the ridiculous nonsense about strife and dissension applause let the fifth of august be a day ever memorable among nations let it be if i may so term it the birthday of england applause among the many points which must have given every one satisfaction was the manner in which this great success was received in america hear hear there appears to have been but one feeling of rejoicing predominant among them and i cannot but think that that was not only owing to their commercial enterprise which they share along with us but also i trust more to the feelings of consanguinity and affection which i am sure we share though occasionally disturbed by international disputes and by differences caused by misrepresentation or hastiness it must still burn as brightly in their breasts as in ours applause i trust that not only with our friends across the atlantic but with every civilized nation this great triumph of science will prove the harbinger of peace goodwill and friendship and that england and america will not verify the first line of the stanza lands intersected by a narrow firth abhor each other but that they will by mutual intercourse arrive at the last line of that stanza and like kindred drops be mingled into one warm applause end of chapter 9 recording by maria casper